trigger warnings for the following content. Murder, stalking, abusive behavior and language, gaslighting, violence, drugging, blackmailing, and emotional manipulation. I may have missed a few, but anything that you think goes along with a book written about a serial killer is going to be in this book. So, just a warning. I'm going to start by breaking down the characters that I think are important. Also, from this point forward, I just want to let you know that there will be spoilers because I'm breaking these characters down now as opposed to when the characters actually come up canonically in the book. I will essentially be ruining the main major twist of the book. I wanted to make this part separate because in the book there are a few names and characters that we have to keep up with as well as the different timelines that they're in. So I just wanted to make this part um, separate so that we could know who and what we're talking about. So first we have Trisha, aka Patricia. She is the first character's POV that we get as well as um, being sort of the main character of the timeline in the book that is supposed to be um, the present day or present day adjacent. Um, she immediately annoyed the hell out of me. Um, in the book though, she is a newlywed, sort of, who is looking for a house with her husband, who she immediately tells us that she has not known for that long. Um, she is also later revealed to not only be a serial killer, but an accessory to murder, some sort of like evil mastermind person. Um, as well as the anonymous patient that Adrian, who we will get to later on in this character breakdown, um, whose book is based off of her. Um, she is also doing some of the emotional manipulation that takes place in the book, both on to characters in the book as well as us as a, as a reader, because I feel like we get most of the story through her eyes. Um, there are some things where we're going, we're traveling with her throughout this book. And then at the very end, she just makes a bunch of declarative statements. And it feels like she's gaslighting me um, because I read the book. I know exactly what was going on. And no, that's not what she was doing. But I digress. Um, next, we have Ethan. Ethan is Trisha's husband. Um, we don't ever get his POV. He's not a well fleshed out character. I don't know if that's on purpose, like to make a statement, like there are men in this book, but they're used in the way that women are usually used in these types of books. But we don't really get a lot on him. The only things we get about him and his backstory are things that Trisha tells us. So. I don't know how much you would believe a murderer and a manipulative person, but he seems to also corroborate these things in the story. But then again, she could be lying to us, so we don't know. But um, basically his main shtick is being like a cartoony, bad, like, husband. He kind of gaslights, even if it's very poorly done. Uh, Trisha in a lot of these situations um, he kind of like emotionally manipulates her he also has really well not really but kind of abusive behavior um, you read him doing things on page and then it's reinforced by Trisha's like inner monologue that yeah this dude is just something's not right with him um, but Despite all that, he's not very important to the story until almost the end, and he feels like an accessory to Trisha, metaphorically, and then actually, like, becoming an accessory to her, like, criminally as well. Um, next we have Adrian. Adrian is supposed to be this revered and mysterious um, genius psychiatrist and best-selling author. And in our present day timeline, we're told that she's missing. So when we get her POV, it's um, about the year or year and a half leading up 
to her disappearance, which we then find out was actually her murder at the hands of Trisha. But um, we get a bunch of like little clues about like what happened to her all throughout her POV. Um, and there is some type of bait and switch going on. There is like a few key players that are going on. So the author's intent was to be like, ooh, it could be any of these people. But I immediately knew who it was like almost immediately. But we won't get that to that until we get into the actual review of the book. Um, she came off to me on page as insufferable as well as arrogant, but she was also really dumb, which is in direct contradiction with the fact that she's supposed to be this very smart and very commandeering, like, psychiatrist, this brilliant mind, and yet she does the dumbest shit I've ever read a person do, ever. Um... She is also guilty of emotional manipulation to her boyfriend and also blackmail to um, Trisha at some point. She also is one of the canonical killers in this book. I would say that her killing is both um, clean, as in there's like not a lot of mess, there's no blood or anything, but also just um categorically cruel the way that she did it um also very stupid so you have that as well um and the only reason i'm bringing up uh the emotional manipulation that she does as well as the blackmail and anything that trisha also does is because um these women are being i don't know if it's unironically and intentional but they are written to be um, bad, and if not bad, morally gray people, um, and that's interesting in concept if it was written on purpose, because, you know, we don't get a lot of books of women just being bad people, or, you know, flawed characters, um, but it was, that was an interesting twist of the book, but I still think that both of them need to be in jail, and they both were given that kind of, like, um, girl boss, gaslight, gatekeep type of energy, so I wasn't really too into it, into it, but, you know, so interesting to see. Um, next we have Luke, who is Adrian's co-worker turned boyfriend. Um, Luke is the only person who doesn't really participate, well, willingly participate in any nefarious or criminal acts, including murder. He's just a dude that, you know, is in love with Adrian is nice and it works in IT that's all you get from him um, we don't know anything about him other than his per like quick progression of a romantic relationship with Adrian and then we don't really see him again and then he comes up just to basically die in a really rude way at the end which brings me to my last point about him which is he deserved a better book. Um, he did not deserve the things that happened to him in this book. Um, I can see why he died because it made sense that people who just kill indiscriminately for whatever re for whatever reason that they make up in their head, which doesn't make sense to us, would have to kill him or want to kill him. But for the story and for like the sake of like the stakes that are written into the book I don't see why he had to die um, especially in that way um, because his death really served nothing it served no purpose like he was murdered but why because it didn't really further them in any way um, and lastly we have the mysterious and equally as idiotic EJ aka Edward um, he's not important to the story other than he's like the cartoonish villain who fucks up Adrian's life he's the only real driving force for I guess the events of this book but um, I find that very funny because 
the motivations for all of this to happen starts with him and the stakes were so low like literally none of this had to happen and i argue that in any other scenario none of this would have happened um based on like the things that he does like it's very far-fetched to think so many people would die or like all of these murders would be so intimately connected because of this one misogynistic nasty dude um and yeah that's his only trait is that he's a villain he's misogynistic and he's creepy and he likes to like blackmail adrian and that's it um the only reason i'm bringing him up here is because he has the same initials as trisha's husband ethan and so he's only referred to his initials up until the last like 10 or so chapters of the book so the whole time you're supposed to think well the author wants you to think oh my god is ej ethan and then you see like similarities in their personality and their like one interest that is mentioned on page but i knew for a fact that it wasn't him because like why would it be him it makes no sense um because i talked about how the women are portrayed in this book i feel like i have to make the same effort for the men i fear um all of the men on page are shitty like caricatures of a shitty dude and the only one who isn't who's kind of just a guy like dies violently um there there really feels like there's no justice for the way that these other two men really act i mean one of them does get murdered but i feel like you know what he did was shitty but was it a murderable offense um but you know I don't know if this is the feminist agenda that I needed or wanted, but it was interesting to see men make up such a small part of this book. Um, I don't know if that's intentional or it was just bad writing, but I guess I will say good job. Now that the characters are out of the way, I'm going to hop right into the plot. And you may be thinking that I've already given away like the ending or like major twists of the book but you'll never guess like where they fall or like how we get there to the reveal so it'll be fun um i've also got decided to do this review in three parts the present timeline with trisha's povs the past timeline with adrian's povs and then the train wreck of an ending there is technically like a hidden fourth timeline that i'm not gonna really address at all because it's just um, recordings of Adrian's patient sessions but they hop around and they're with different patients on different days and stuff like that but um, the things that they do reveal are like in direct correlation with clues and like reveals we get in either um, timeline so I'm just gonna lump them all in there together Um, also this plot summary may be a little bit out of order because I'm working off notes I took when I read this book over like two months ago and you must be smoking if you think a reading is shit again so this may not be 100% accurate sorry the book opens with Trisha and Ethan driving to a house viewing despite the fact that there is inclement weather particularly like a blizzard slash snowstorm type of deal the house is kind of isolated from like the main road slash town so there is a real sense of like apprehension in both trisha as well as the reader and already i was thinking that this was fucking stupid because it makes no sense to me why you would go to a house viewing and there's a snowstorm coming also what realtors out here like yeah you can come look at this house that's cut off from society in the middle of a blizzard But obviously they get stuck at the house when they pull onto the only road that leads to the house and their car gets snuck in the snow and they end up having to foot it to the house. Um, This is a tangent, but this scene of them actually walking to the house is really weird because at some point it almost is like it's an ad read or like a commercial for Manolo Boots 
and it was just odd to me because why is this in here why do we care about her specific brand of boots and how luxurious they are and it got me thinking can authors have like product placement in their books um also this isn't the only scene or like time that this happens in the book and it bothered me a little bit not really bothered but it was just something weird that i took note of and each time it happened it was like even weirder but um back to the story trisha immediately notices that their realtor's car is not parked anywhere in the driveway or on the road leading up to the house but they do notice that there is like a single light on in one of the upstairs rooms and that unsettles at least to our knowledge Trish I don't know if it unsettles Ethan we don't really get his POV we only know what he says to her um, and nothing else but I do want to know that even if Ethan did not physically see the light he was uh, made aware of the light um, and he immediately is like oh there's a light on so that must mean that the realtor is here even though her car isn't here so I want you to remember that both of them at some point acknowledges that there is a light or may have been a light on at some point when they're walking up to the house um, when they get up onto the porch of the house they conveniently find the key to the house under like um, like a welcome mat or something and that makes no fucking sense and that realtor is gonna get fired because that key should have been in a lockbox and they go ahead and go into the house to escape the storm immediately uh, Trisha as well as any other person that has been to a house viewing or has common sense knows that the realtor or no one else has been to the house because it's not cleaned there's no lights on there's no stage setting it's dirty it's dusty like it looks like it's been abandoned or like undisturbed since the house went onto the market um, they start looking around the house trying to find a way to get on like the lights and the heat and maybe find some food because they don't know how long they'll be there and they don't want to like be hungry and miserable for how many or many hours or days they might have to stay there in the process of exploring they stumble upon some items such as like a huge portrait of what appears to be the ex-owner of the house and they notice that it is the famous psychiatrist Adrian who like went missing a little over a year ago right before her second book came out the only thing you need to know about this book is that it's like a non-fiction type beat about how Adrian helped a young woman through immense trauma that she I guess gained or acquired when she was the lone survivor of a random attack that left her two friends and fiance dead um trisha and ethan get into a small argument about adrian and the only things you really need to know about this argument is that one trisha has some type of weird complex of like fear as well as like admiration for adrian and it makes her uncomfortable to be in this woman's house especially since she's missing um ethan really dislikes adrian and it seems like it's a personal dislike like he may have known her personally and lastly trisha seems to be like afraid of her husband she's like afraid that he might like just fly up at the handle or like be upset if she tells him the truth about certain things um this plays a role immediately because Trisha is like really creeped out about the fact that they're in this house like this missing woman's house and she could come back at some time or like she could be dead and it feels like a very um violating thing for them to be doing and she does not want to buy this house for that reason she's like I'll buy any other house I just don't want to live here I don't want to be in this house another minute but her husband Ethan is immediately like in love with that he's like oh we're gonna have babies and this is how we're gonna decorate this room and can't you just see it and so instead of like telling him because I said she thinks he has a temper she's like yeah I love this house and she basically lies the whole book about liking it even though she really hates it and she's like there's no fucking way in hell 
uncle ever live in his house. We also get a little bit of backstory about Ethan and Trisha's relationship that kind of alarmed me but was very funny to me as well. Um, basically, Trisha and Ethan are newlyweds, and that means canonically in this book that they dated, became engaged, and got married, but they've only ever kn- but they've only known each other for maybe a year, which is like a big yikes for me. We also get the first of many inner monologues of Trisha trying to like convince us, or it kind of seems like she's trying to convince herself that even though she knows he has no family or friends even though he refuses to divulge any information about himself like past his name age and where he lives even though she thinks he may have have like a temper that is specifically violent or abusive in nature and even though all of her friends think he's like really weird and creepy and a narcissist she's just like no he's a he's a great guy he's just like misunderstood i'm the only person that gets him and i'm like okay dumb bitch i don't care um this is written in because it's important to the ending of the book but still makes me laugh a little bit while trisha is being annoying ethan has went off and somehow gotten the power and the heat on to me that was like really suspicious because it was like really soon after them coming into this house that they are um, pretending like they have no prior knowledge of Um, and it kind of seems like the scene was written as both to be like triggering for Trisha as well as the reader to be like hmm something's afoot because of how quickly he did it and how like unlikely it would be that he would be able to just like stumble upon it in the first five minutes of them being in there but it's never returned to again um it's never explained or like really addressed again ever in any type of way so i guess he was just lucky like that i don't know it's never said anything about um after the lights and stuff come on they both go to the kitchen to see if they can find some food and surprisingly they find um a pack of um lunch meat and bread in the refrigerator and both of them are like relatively new they're unexpired like the expiration date is like a couple days off so like very safe to eat um this is weird both immediately to me as well as trisha because that means that somebody's been in that house somebody like went out and bought current groceries and put them in the fridge also these things have already been opened so someone's been eating this and ethan is not worried about this at all he's just like oh that makes sense bologna and bread in the fridge that yeah that makes sense to me and trisha is like hey you don't think this is weird like this house is supposed to be vacant on the market obviously the realtor hasn't been here because it's dirty And he's like, nah, girl, I don't know what the hell are you talking about. Obviously, the realtor brought it here for us because she knew we was coming. And that is where he starts his, like, poorly written attempts at, like, gaslighting. And they're just so dumb and ineffective, in my opinion, because gaslighting is supposed to be, like, this really conniving and, like, manipulative and, like, really, not really artful, but well thought out plan to make you question your reality but you're in a dirty house the realtor is not there there's open lunch meat in the fridge and you're the only two people in the house you can't convince me that this makes sense also why would the realtor go out and just buy bread and bologna nothing else and then she also ate it too and then just left it behind for you like that makes literally no sense (laughs) but all of his actions in regards to like very real concerns that his wife has um make no sense because the author is kind of using him to like trick us into thinking everything is copacetic or that like um that this is a man who is experiencing the same shit as Trisha and just doesn't give a fuck and 
on either side of that it makes no sense why that's there because clearly Trish is not wrong or crazy and he should also have a little bit more self-preservation and like smarts to like see what's obviously in front of him so it doesn't really serve the story in any purpose other than to make him like a shitty dude After this like toothless argument that they have about who actually put the lunch meat where and blah blah blah, um, they kind of just like drop it because she doesn't want to argue and she thinks that like if they continue this he's going to get like really aggressive or something with her and she doesn't want to go through that. And then he starts to like hit on her or something I don't really remember but I just knew that it was like weird and she like is okay with it she's like oh that's the Ethan that I know and here I want to make an aside that like in the book other than gaslighting and just straight up lying to her about things that she clearly sees with her own eyes that have physical proof um he doesn't really display any other like tendencies that would make me think yeah this dude has been violent in the past with someone or he could be violent with her right now so I don't really know where she's getting this notion that he has this like violent temper from unless it's something that happened before this book but then why put that in there if you're not going to demonstrate that other than just him lying but whatever um after this argument, like I said, um, Trisha clears the plates and she puts them in the sink, but she also notices that there's a cup in the sink that has been recently used. Like, it has a little bit of water still left in there. Someone was clearly drinking water very, like, soon ago. And this causes her to, like, spiral again because, like, if it was the real to her, why is she in here eating sandwiches and drinking water, but she hiding in the dark now? That don't make no damn sense. And in this spiraling, she also has this, like, recurrent thought about how she has some, like, horrible secret that she doesn't want Ethan to know. Because, like, what if he actually becomes violent with her and it's like, damn, girl, what is it? But it's not nothing that's fucking, um, really important at all. It makes really no fucking sense on why she was scared about telling him, as well as why is this big-ass, uh, secret that she had to keep because she like immediately after this spills the beans but um she brings up the cup to Ethan and she's like hey don't you think this is weird and then his ugly ass is all like you're being insane even though this is like a legitimate like concern to have because like you can see the cup um when they go back into the like living room like Fourier area she noticed that there is some like foot or like shoe prints in the dust and she points them out to him I don't know why at this point because he's like categorically shot her down every time she said anything about this but he's like I don't know those are probably yours or maybe it's the realtors and it's like not even the type of shoe that she fucking wearing so how the fuck could it be hers um and at this point I was like wow he really fucking hate her and he's stupid because there's no other explanation for why he's like refusing to look at the fucking obvious or believe his wife like nah that bitch can't be right and I refuse to critically think so to deflect from having to answer Ethan's questions about how much she likes the house and like does she really want to be here and stuff like that she kind of just blurts out her dark secret, which was that she found out that she's pregnant. Um, apparently, they had discussed waiting up to five years uh, before having kids because they kind of wanted to just enjoy themselves and travel as like a newlywed couple. And she thinks because of this, Ethan is going to be upset with her for like, I guess, lying and like getting pregnant too early. But Ethan is like super excited to hear this news. So excited that he wants to fuck. 
Uh, this scene is also really weird to me because why the hell do you want to fuck on this in this nasty ass house in this missing person's house also Trisha why are you afraid to tell your husband that you're like pregnant to the point where you think he's gonna get physically violent with you like why the fuck are y'all together while he's trying to fuck her on the couch um they hear a noise upstairs and Trisha's like feels vindicated she's like damn he's gonna really have to take me uh serious now because that sounds exactly like somebody walking around up there and so like this one time he's like oh okay there's something like legitimately going on so like he goes to the kitchen and he grabs a knife out of like a knife block and I was confused about that because did the realtor bring those knives in there um why would you bring those knives in there when you already work as a realtor where that's like kind of a dangerous job like you providing your own weapons to be murdered with like where did these knives come from but um they he takes a knife she follows him upstairs they look in all the houses i'm sorry the rooms but they don't find anything um trisha and i are immediately like somebody must have been in here because they look in all the rooms and there's no lights on in any of the rooms so somebody turn off the lights well ethan eternally in his manipulation bag was like can you be sure that you saw that like what if it was a trick of the light what if it was a reflection bouncing off of the windows and to be honest i wanted to slap her and him the author and myself because when they were outside she points out the light and this dude says that it was most likely the realtor right when they see no signs of the car of said realtor he says oh she probably parked in the garage or like around the back of the house but like why the fuck would she do that two when the light is off when they go to check the rooms upstairs he's like oh guess there was never a light on in the first place like at this point why are you even continuing to like do this he's like also gaslighting himself at this point never mind the fact that the reason he likes this house like one of the big selling points for him is that the house is isolated where the fuck is this light coming from to bounce off the fucking windows to give this illusion that that, that tricked both of them where's the light coming from but to him, because he didn't see nobody, that means nobody was there. So he's fine. He's like, I'm just going to go back downstairs. We're going to forget that this ever fucking happened. He's not that good at gaslighting us, nor Trisha, because Trisha is, like, so unconvinced. And she's so scared that somebody's going to come down the attic and beat them upside their heads and bludgeon them t to death in their sleep. And she's, like, kind of contemplating just, like, running out into the snow and, like, just sleeping in the car or some shit but she obviously doesn't do that but she's also afraid that they're gonna have to stay in this house that there is a person there like how long are they gonna be in this house what if the heat turns off what if they run out of bologna and bread and they die around this point they have a, like another like argument where she's very toothless and like anemic and it's all about where they're gonna sleep for the night she wants to maybe sleep downstairs because um, she definitely heard a sound up there and that means in her mind that there's a person up there um, that means that they would have easier access to bludgeon them in the sleep um, also because the only room that is furnished in the house is Adrian's old bedroom and if they sleep in there they're gonna have to sleep in her old bed which is like very creepy and weird to her but she like almost immediately gives in after Ethan's like no but we gotta sleep up in here at this point Trisha becomes really annoying and like grating to me because she has the first of this like, plethora of like an eternal internal monologues about how she's fucking disgusted and creeped out and she can't even fathom why um, he would be even an iota of comfortable in this situation and now they're gonna be not only ganting the gallivant around this woman's house but sleeping in her bed oh my god that's disrespectful 
And I was like, okay, girl, damn, we get it. Ethan is like comically also annoying because he's like the exact extreme opposite of Trisha. And he's just like, well, a bed is a bed. She ain't coming back. So she can't use it. So I might as well sleep in it. At some point, they do like turn in for the night. Trisha can't like fall asleep. So she wanders downstairs at some point or whatever to um, go to a bookshelf that I haven't mentioned until right now and behind the bookshelf is a secret room and inside this secret room are a bunch of physical tape recordings of Adrian's sessions that she had with patients that she saw in her home office and Trisha's nosy ass decides to grab a few and like go find that tape recorder in uh, Trisha's old home office and like listen to some tapes you know so her uh, sleep insomnia and stuff like that can like go away she has this like little throwaway line about how much Ethan would be upset if he knew that she was listening to other people's business because he hates gossip and he hates how much she loves gossip but it don't really bother her too much because she still listens to them bitches anyway uh, that night she listened to several tapes and over no, maybe one or two. And over the course of like the two or three, maybe four days that they're there, she listens to a lot of tapes. Um, the only thing you need to know about the tapes is that Trisha finds a potential suspect for Adrian's disappearance in the tapes, which don't make no sense after the reveal. But his name is EJ, and she also briefly mentions um, another patient who is an old woman whose name I can't place right now who was seeing Adrian for what seems to be like paranoid delusions. EJ himself is a really weird part of the story because the author tries to intentionally lead the reader to believe that EJ and Ethan are the same person because they have the same initials. And EJ is never really called by his first name until like he dies at the end of the book. So this whole time we're thinking, hey, these two characters have a lot alike. Ooh, what if this is this person? Like, what if her husband actually had something to do with it? It is not really done effectively, and it's kind of not really important to the story because it never really lands, it never really rings true. And even if we were supposed to think that Trisha thinks that, she never really does. And you can tell that she doesn't. And you can also tell that she categorically knows that that's not her husband in those tapes. So I don't know why I was there. It just felt kind of sloppy. As well as very irritating to keep revisiting this. She continues to listen to the tapes in secret. As well as, well as find evidence that suggests that someone has been living in the house. Which turns out to be true because Luke... Um, Adrian's ex-boyfriend has been living in the house um, he says he's been living in the house because right after Adrian's disappearance he was like the main suspect he lost his job because of it everyone in town um, couldn't prove that he did it but were very like judgmental about it no one wanted to hire him he ended up couldn't pay his rent so he's just been like homeless and like just living in this house ever since and he's like heartbroken because he does not know what happened to Adrian um around the time that is revealed that Luke is the person that's been living in the house we also get the reveal that there is a body underneath the floorboards inside of Adrian's um home office Ethan immediately is like, oh, that's obviously Adrian's body. We need to, like, tie him up and, like, get the police out here because we're obviously living in a house with a murderer. So, like, he beats him up, he ties him up, and they, like, leave him inside the home office and lock the door um, with the dead body. And Ethan is like, hey, I'm going to walk to the main road so I can get some cell service. And I'm going to call the snowplow to, like, get us out of here so we don't have to spend another minute here with him. I'm also going to call the police because, duh. 
and he tells Trisha before he leaves that like she needs to stay out of the room because she's pregnant he doesn't want her to get too stressed out he also doesn't want um Luke to do anything crazy to her make him lose his wife and his baby and he's just like don't go up there and talk to him leave him alone he's obviously a dangerous dude and obviously she does not do any of that and she immediately goes up to talk to Luke and they both like start to talking and colluding and um talking about facts that they think they found and they both come to the conclusion that the body in the floorboards could not possibly have been Adrian's because somehow the police would have known and also because Luke noticed that the person that like well decomposed in the floorboards is wearing jeans and his girlfriend ain't never worn no damn jeans in her life and I was like damn I didn't know these two was forensic scientists after this talk Trisha kind of like she's like tells him that she believes him or like she says that she believes him that she thinks that he loved Adrian too much to actually do anything to her so like she knows that whatever whoever's body this is it couldn't possibly be Adrian's but it really couldn't possibly have been because of Luke because he just doesn't seem like that type of dude Trisha goes back downstairs um because Luke tries to like ask her to untie him and he's just like I'll just leave like you'll never see me again she's like no I can't do that my husband's gonna like call the police and you have to be here he's gonna get mad at me so she goes back downstairs and then she starts listening to some tapes and then we realize that she's listening to her own sessions with Adrian because Trisha is actually Patricia dun, dun, dun. Um, this is where we can switch over to Adrian's timeline but before that I like to bring up a few things that really struck me as downright nasty at some point Ethan goes rambling through drawers and finds some men's clothing in Adrian's house and he decides that you know what I need a shower I'm gonna put these clothes on nasty Trisha for all her talk up on her high horse first walks around in Adrian's robe and slippers nasty she then changes into Adrian's cashmere sweater which is like the other big like ad read slash commercial for like cashmere sweaters but when she touches it she basically kind of like gets real horny about it nasty now that we go into adrian's timeline we get background information as well as um another main reveal that really catapults this story into lunacy and it really um talks about how this story and all of these events came to be so adrian was seeing patients in her home as well as volunteering her services at a public clinic for free um She's also finishing up her second book and just mostly living her best single successful woman life. Uh, that all goes out of the window when she tries to drop EJ as a client because she thinks he's a creepy tool and technically he broke and he ain't paying for these sessions and she don't do the shit for free. Something about this spurs EJ into like a weird stalking obsession which is not well fleshed out maybe because we don't get his POV but also maybe because the author is not like that strong of a writer to like really cultivate or make his actions make sense but EJ stalks Adrian to her job at the public clinic and he gets a video of her slashing someone's tires <laughs> so like we know that she does this because she was accidentally running late to the clinic and when she got to the clinic she wanted to get this specific spot because it was closer to the clinic and she wouldn't be as late and she'd get her to her appointment on time because these people really need these services and this person just kind of like stole the spot she was waiting for and she like rationalizes like slashing this person's tires because she's like she really cares about the work that she does here and it's actually important and fulfilling in a way that her like paid work doesn't fulfill her and all her books and that like it's unfair for her to be late for these sessions with people who actually need it and like him stealing that spot really just like 
set her back and could have possibly fucked up someone's like mental health journey so she slashed that bitch tires and I was like damn what a noble queen but he eventually uses this video to blackmail her into seeing him for sessions for free and then it escalates to making her see him multiple times of the week and then he starts popping up willy-nilly at her house at all times of the night and then finally he like says hey I'll stop blackmailing you if you ride this dick while this is going on right up until the point where he tries to like blackmail sex out of her she's been trying really hard to like meet his demands as best as possible and not like really give any like attitude really because she figures that if this video gets out it could kill her reputation as well as her book sales plus it can make her look bad to luke her co-worker who is starting to like like her she's starting to like him they got some like romance vibes going on um the reason that she knows luke is because he works for the it department at the public office that she kind of volunteers at her relationship with luke has been like growing slowly growing stronger and she wants to be like a hundred percent all in on this relationship because she thinks that like it could really go somewhere but ej is just consistently in the way he's always popping up at her house late at night when they supposed to be on dates together he's like calling her he's texting her and like following her everywhere if she thinks um he could do something violent or like show luke the video and she is just always on edge so that can really um, pushes Adrian to confess to Luke about EJ and his like blackmail video. She doesn't tell him what's in the video, but she just tells him that he's blackmailing her with a video. And she emotionally manipulates Luke into a plan to like somehow delete this blackmail video off EJ's personal devices. Um, basically the plan they come up with is to like drug EJ, break into his house, um, Luke will hack into his computer and delete all the copies of the video after not watching it because she really doesn't want him to watch it and while he's passed out at Adrian's house she'll delete all the copies of the video off of his like um, phone. Um, now this is not the original plan that she like came to him with she like tried to soft launch the idea of like murdering him and Lucas obviously like nah bitch that's crazy stop playing and she's like you right I was just playing at first Luke is very adverse to the idea um because he's already previously been in trouble of some sort with of like the police or in the authorities because back in his day before he like got a legitimate IT job he was like hacking shit and the police are like hey you gotta stop this shit or you're like going to prison so he like turned his life around he's a law abiding citizen and like if he is found to be hacking again you know he could like go to jail he could lose his job he could um, be banned from using the internet so like the stakes are very high for him this could fuck up his life and he really does not want to do this he keeps asking her is there no other way if we can like get him to go away you like can't pay him you can't do this this and that and she's like no nah, this is the only way and like she uses the fact well she kind of comes to the conclusion she says during this conversation that she really loves him and so she has to do whatever she can to like make sure that their life together is not jeopardized and she hasn't told him that she loves him and so she uses this fact to like basically push him over the edge into agreeing so she tells him that she loves him for the first time and like if you love me you would do this you know I love you so he reluctantly agrees so the plan goes like she tells EJ to come over um because between telling her he wants her to fuck and like this plan with Luke he gave her some time to like figure out like when and where they're gonna do it if she wants to do it and like whether or not he's gonna put out the tape or not so she like sets out a bottle of wine for him because she knows he's really into wine but she like put a bunch of like I guess sleeping pills inside of it and she lets him drink like almost all of the bottle of wine by himself and he obviously passes out 
So she digs around in his pocket, she takes his keys, and she gives them to Luke. While he's driving to his house, to EJ's house, and like breaking into his apartment and erasing the video off his computer and like laptop and shit, Adrian uh, goes into his phone and deletes the video from his phone. When Luke comes back, they like load EJ into EJ's car. Luke drives the car back. She drives Luke's truck and they like leave him passed out in his car in front of his like apartment building and they drive back together and Luke is like yeah I'm gonna have to break up with you because this shit is crazy and I really don't like how you did this like you seeming like a bad person to me now for some reason after Luke does not want anything to do with her and he's like not answering her calls and he's not like talking to her at work and he's like not really showing up on the shifts Adrian j- just didn't realize this oh damn that was kind of fucked up that I made him like I blackmailed him and like emotionally ma- manipulated him into like being an accessory to like breaking and entering and like hacking and shit but we don't really get a chance to like fully develop those feelings or anything like that because it's just like kind of like a time skip of like Adrian and Luke are starting to talk again they're starting to get back to a place where they think they can get back together and then EJ out of the blue just like sends her the blackmail video again but he also sends her like security footage of Luke inside of his house like hacking into his computer he also is very patient he's like I'm gonna give you a little bit more time you really don't have to outperform yourself on sucking my dick cause you didn't really fuck this up for yourself and this and this dude so Adrian is like well I tried it the nice way I'm gonna have to kill this dude because she is not going to let him one fuck up her life which she's not really like that concerned about what she's really concerned about is him fucking up Luke's life because she's like actually deeply in love with this dude now and it's really fucked up that she got him in this situation in the first place so she's like he got it high now this is the part of the story when we found out that trisha is actually patricia and also a patient to adrian as well as the subject of adrian's upcoming book basically patricia was the victim in air quotes of a horrific crime um patricia her unnamed former fiance her unnamed best friend and a third less important friend were having a cute little cabin getaway and a crazy man breaks into the cabin and stabs everyone to death except for Trisha who just gets away um but she's bleeding a lot and she runs out into the rain in the middle of the road and she asks for help but plot twist Adrian could tell from her sessions with Trisha that she was a liar and also the real killer so in Patricia's last le- sessions with her, she tells Patricia point blank, I know that you're a liar, I know that you killed on people, and you gonna help me um, with this problem that I got, which is EJ. So Trisha goes to EJ's favorite casino while he's there, she like drugs his drink, I know right, repeat for the second time, and then drives him unconscious to um adrian's house after she like brings him inside adrian's like thanks you can leave now she kind of just like wants to stay around she's like so what mm, what you gonna do with him are you like gonna kill him like what's the plan and adrian's like girl mind your fucking business and leave this has nothing to do with you so trisha like makes some like vague ass threats and be like hey you better know what you're fucking doing because like i could be implicated in this shit and Adrian's like again you can leave you're not implicated in nothing so she finally leaves and Adrian is free to act out her nefarious villain plan which is to tie all of EJ's limbs up gag him and then she puts him in a small safe like structure underneath the floorboards in her office and it's not technically airtight but it's airtight enough um and when she closes it, he finally wakes up. She can hear him screaming and thrashing around as he suffocates to death. Now that shit was, that was nefarious. That shit was kind of, I was like, oh, okay, she kind of evil. But um, the plan seems to work. 
because no one at all come looking for him or even really knows it or seems to know that he's missing um after a few weeks like of the smell and like dissipating because she like lit a few candles i guess or some shit she like has her office repainted to also cover up any like lingering smell that might be there but like none of the workers say anything weird or anything like that so adrian and luke become like a thing again and they're like ready to move in together adrian's like i may not ever want to get married but i feel like i might want to spend the rest of my life together with him um so they're finally back to a place she feels better because ej is gone and like since they're gonna move into her house together she's like oh i gotta find a spot to like move ej's body because i don't ever want to like be with luke and like he stumps upon the body and then i lose him forever because i really did cross the line with this so Adrian is having this thought while she's like driving home from work at the clinic um Luke is supposed to come over to her house to meet up with her later but when she drives up to her house she sees Trisha's nosy ass parked out front of it so when she gets out the car Trisha for some reason is like all demanding like she wants to know exactly what happened to EJ did you kill him if you did kill him where is the body? Is there any evidence that can point to me or you? We need to get rid of it. And AJ is like, bitch, hey, it's been like three months. Nobody is looking for his ass. Just let it go. You don't need to know any of this because even if on the off chance the police come to say something to you, you don't know nothing. So you can't be implicated. And I don't know nothing. So he like even if you send them to my house you know i can say i don't know where that fucking nigga is but trisha is not trying to hear that because even though she has like been religiously checking social media and the news and like any other reports that may have been like this local man is missing she ain't seen shit but she's just like very convinced and concerned that there is something that Adrian has that would eventually point back to her and that's like really sloppy so she waits until Adrian turns around beats her upside the head kills her and then buries her in the woods and that's obviously where Adrian's POV ends but thank god that we are at the end of the book so let me try to speed through this after this reveal Trisha is having like this inner monologue where she's basically yeah I did that shit but I'm not a bad person I've just been put in a bunch of really fucked up situations she goes on to justify killing her fiance and her two friends because she found out that her fiance and best friend were having an affair like a month or a couple weeks before her wedding so she came up with this plan to invite them to a cabin weekend getaway and then kill them there and she ended up inviting the third less important friend because she wanted to make it look more believable it would be really suspicious if these two cheating people died and she lived and then she goes on to justify killing adrian very loosely by saying that she needed to find ej's body if there was one and dispose of any evidence if there were any just dumbass shit she also confesses like to orchestrating this whole house viewing thing like no one knows that they're there the realtor does not know anything about this house like no one knows that they're supposed to be at this house she did all this and lied to her husband just to come here to find this imaginary ass body in evidence that she didn't know was actually there and then she starts uh, taking a page out of Ethan's book and starts gaslighting the fuck out of us and saying that yeah this whole time she's been looking for clues and digging around in rooms and trying to find any evidence that she could which is obviously not the fucking case at this point Ethan comes back to the house and he tells Trisha that he actually didn't call the police which is like why and when he called the snowplow company he found out that someone had already like paid in cash for the snowplow to come the next morning so he's like 
I guess we're just gonna have to wait until tomorrow to leave, which is so fucking dumb to me because if you think you and your pregnant wife are in danger and there's a murderous man upstairs why the hell would you not call the police why would you not say hey get the snow plow out of here or eat out here immediately um at some point they get into a small spat because he finds out that she's been listening to these tapes and at some point she like leaves the room for some reason and she comes back and she saw that he like is burning some tapes in the fireplace um, she asked him, hey, like, what are you doing? And he, like, kind of breaks down and confesses that his mother was actually the old woman who was, like, paranoid that Adrian was seeing. And his mother was basically worried and, like, always suspicious that Ethan was out to kill her. And was presumably, like, violent or some form of, like, unreasonable or harassing towards him for like a lot of years because of this like suspicion that she had that was unfounded she does eventually like get better with medication and adrian's help through the sessions but one day they get into an ax an argument of some sort and he accidentally pushes her down the stairs and she dies um this confession spurs trisha to like tell him everything which makes no sense because literally this the inner monologue she had right before he told her this was how she would never tell anyone the crazy shit she's done because no one would ever stay understand and like even if her husband did understand this she didn't want him to think of her in a different light so like she would go to the grave with this information but whatever so she decides to tell him about the murder she committed back at the cabin and how she like delivered EJ to um, Adrian and that's probably EJ's body upstairs under the floorboards and how Luke had nothing to do with it and how she killed Adrian and buried her in the woods and how she already knew that he killed his mother because she had been stalking them him before they got together and after he killed his mother well what she thought he killed his mother she was like oh that's the man for me so she like purposefully invented their little meat cute that they had at a coffee shop to like fall in love with him and make him fall in love with her he seems to have like no real reaction to all of this and he's kind of like wow i understand why you did this and seeing him be outwardly okay with the information that she just gave him Trisha like pushes further and she's like you know what we have to do now we have to go upstairs and kill Luke to protect ourselves and he agrees and so they both go upstairs and she watches as Ethan stabs Luke to get to death um after all this they put an offer in on the house as soon as they're able to leave and they obviously get the house because no one was really bidding for it or anything when they do move into the house they end up burying both of the bodies in the garden um they eventually have two kids if i'm remembering correctly and the story ends with trisha watching her husband play with one of their children in the garden while she like sits on the back porch and she thinks about how she would definitely totally kill him without any hes hesitation if he ever got weak in the knees and decided that he wanted to snitch on her and that is the end of the book we are finally at the conclusion which i know personally that i am happy about because this video is too damn long and honestly this book has been living real reckless reckless as hell in my brain since January and I'm very mad about it and I need to talk to somebody about it firstly I want to say that I think that this book is absolutely awful I have always been a fan of the thriller genre in general I have not really been actively reading new releases or like anything other than almost like fan fiction stuff for like the last eight years or so so um this is my first like book book um that i've read in a long time and i s decided that 
I wanted to like get back into the game of reading so I picked this and I am so disappointed like honey I have read better stuff for free on Wattpad of all places I feel kind of scammed really like I paid money to read this with my Kindle Unlimited subscription and apparently this is a best-selling and if the Goodreads reviews are any indication a well-received book and girl where are the standards to get back to the technical stuff I have really three main reasons that I don't like this book which all just stem from the author's lackluster writing skills and actual plot planning. Reason number one, these characters are all as dumb as a box of rocks and as deep as a fucking puddle. Trisha is the shining example of this. Bitch just be doing shit and she seems to be controlling the plot and the narrative rather than being a part of it. Whatever this bitch says she is we just have to believe it whatever she says happens makes sense even if it logically doesn't she was not only annoying because of her personality but because she didn't stay consistent to me as a character i know who the hell is coming to thriller anything to read good characters me bitch and if they aren't interesting and complex or good can they at least make fucking sense or be fun to read my second reason which is I think where the bad writing really like manifests itself is the inconsistent nature of the book it seems like at no point the author was committed to writing a thriller nothing was technically thrilling about this book I want to go on record as saying that plot twists do not equal thrill. Just because you have some crazy twists does not mean that you wrote a thriller. Thrillers are about the atmospheres, the clues that are like weaved throughout the narrative, the underlying mystery, the thrilling nature of it, the building stakes, the crescendo which was not at all in this book. The mystery was unclear most of the time. I did not even know that the book was supposed to be the exploration and the um, ultimate conclusion of why Adrian went missing or even if she was missing as opposed to dead. I thought this was just gonna be like a murder mystery in a dead woman's house or like maybe a haunting book. Obviously I was wrong. And the atmosphere of the book wasn't thrilling. It just kind of felt like a white woman complaining about stuff the whole time. And when you think about the twists, they're actually insane. Like soap opera level insane. They're very surface level in nature. And they just are there to drive us to the end of, of the book. But if you think about them for more than three seconds, they fall apart and they don't make any fucking sense. And the third and final reason that I don't like this book is that this story should have been told in a completely different way. Like a completely different POV, completely different like um, reveal of twist. There is one scene that bothers me the most in this book. And that is the scene where the dead body on the under the floor was like revealed or found by the characters. Trisha freaks the fuck out and it seems like she is so shocked to see like a dead body like she's never seen a dead person at all ever in her life. Which makes no sense. A. Because she's definitely seen dead bodies for which she was directly responsible for. And B. She had guessed that EJ was dead and was specifically murdered by Adrian. So why was this shocking if she told us, the reader, that she came to the house looking for a dead body? Also, she gets really like 
guilt-ridden and like sick to her stomach at some point about the fact that she could be responsible for this man's death inadvertently or otherwise even though she has killed murdered unalived four fucking people that didn't bother her at all and then she didn't kill Luke but forced her husband to do it is she guilty about that one I don't fucking know they never say this scene would have actually been impactful or shocking or relevant at all to the story and the reveal that she was actually a murderer if the author had decided to write the book in third person this would could have been a good twist or maybe even a little thrilling but because it's in Trisha's POV we get to see her freak out about this dead body and then immediately a chapter later talk about all the murders she fucking caused it makes no sense lastly I would like to talk about some honorable mentions for shit that really pissed me off one couldn't Adrian have paid someone to suppress the blackmail video if it came out since she was so rich and famous two would the video really have made her book sales dwindle isn't any publicity good publicity three why did she kill EJ at her fucking house four why did Adrian even ask Trisha to help her with her EJ disposal plan if she knew that that bitch was unhinged deranged a liar a manipulative person and a control freak why did Trisha care so much about finding evidence and or EJ's body six does it killing all of those people and blackmailing other people into killing people for you create more fucking evidence that you're going to have to eventually cover up seven why are there so many murderers in such a concentrated area eight why did Luke need to die nine why the hell did Ethan not call the fucking cops Ten. why could they just show up to that house like that why was it just open why was there like why was it just out on the market with the address open if it wasn't even up for sale yet 11 why was the key for the house not fucking secured if the house was owned by the bank and lastly before I wrap up this entire thing I would like to extend an, abo- an apology both to the realtor because I was really lying on your good name and I'm sorry about that and an apology to Luke because you deserved better everything a better girlfriend a better death and honestly a better book to be written into finally I would like to say that I gave this book two out of five stars on Goodreads because this shit was bad but it wasn't particularly hurtful or problematic really I say one stars for books that should like disappear from existence like no take that shit off the internet I was shocked that I read so many people in Goodreads go into bat for this book I mean, damn. In theory, there are reasons why this book might be enjoyable to people. And those people interest me because did you really actually want to read a thriller or were you just here looking for some mess? But I don't want to be nasty. The book wasn't for me. If you like, like, white, wine drunk, white women type stories with a lot of mess, this could be a good book for you. Uh, it's not thrilling it's not a thriller maybe a little bit of a mystery but mostly it's just hot ass mess 
And if you're down to read some hot ass mess, this book is the book for you. But if you're actually coming to read a thriller, baby, no, please choose something else. We are finally at the conclusion, which I know personally that I am happy about because this video is too damn long. And honestly, this book has been living real reckless, reckless as hell in my brain since January and I'm very mad about it and I need to talk to somebody about it.